Dr. Marco Guerrero here. He's working uh, on CalStack and he did his PhD at the University of Toronto for moving to CalStack. And he is very heavily involved in the Herschel Hermes project. And today he's talking about the connection between galaxy evolution, cosmology, and cosmic infrared background. That's right. That's great. Thanks for having me. So uh, in this talk, I kind of uh, begin at the beginning because I think a lot of people with the astronomy uh, don't really do infrared so much. And so they get confused when, they, when, when I talk about you know, fields with such a big beam. And so I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about why a lot of this stuff. And then the techniques that we used to get around problems. So things like auto and cross correlations of the infrared background is a tool to do things like det determining the dark matter hosts of the dusty star forming galaxies to the through their clustering properties or determining the, the optical to infrared <coughs> background connection and things like that. And then I get to the end I, I talk about some cosmological applications and uh, in the future that we have surveys in the infrared. <coughs> Stop me at any point, particularly if you have questions about the uh, how to connect these two different things, because that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to show you that although there are problems, that there are uh, limitations, they can be overcome. If you're clever, right? Okay. So why do we talk about the far infrared background? What is it exactly in the infrared that's going on? So this you might have seen this before. This is. Uh, uh, it's uh, M31 in the optical and the near infrared, or the uh, far infrared and submillimeter. First thing to notice is that the distribution of the light here is different. It's because uh, this light is coming from stars, and this light is coming from dust. This dust absorbed the starlight and then re-emitted it as a black body, as a modified black body in the far infrared and submillimeter. And they're in different places, right? There's not that much light in the center here in this bulge. It's all happening in the arms. And in the arms, we know, is where star formation is taking place, right? And the dust, it turns out, is actually the most efficient at absorbing the UV, the blue optical, the, the very energetic light, the light that's coming from these star forming regions. So in that sense, dust is a very good tracer of star formation. Here's a spectral energy distribution of a typical disk like galaxy. This is the optical light, and some of it's been absorbed and readmitted here in the infrared. The modified black body, the modified plane function, right? And different galaxies have a different ratio of the optical to infrared body. The most luminous galaxies, the ones that are forming the most stars, are also the ones that have much more infrared emission than they do op optical. They're dominated by their infrared back of light. So it seems like it, this is a perfect place to be looking for very star forming galaxies. So, how important is this optical, uh, is this infrared background? Well, we can look at uh, measurements of the, uh, the total backgrounds from several different measurements. And the point here to take away is that the optical background and the infrared background, the intensity on the background are similar. So that if we want to get a full picture of galaxy evolution, we really have to have an understanding of the infrared background to the same level of uh, completeness that we do the optical. Well, if that's the case, then why does it feel like the infrared background, the infrared observations, submillimeter observations are so new? Right? I mean, it's a thing that has been going on now for, for 20 years, but in 20 years it's not. And the, the reason is that it's just, it's just difficult. To, to observe in the submillimeter, particularly from the ground, it's very, very challenging. This is a, uh, a figure showing the uh, transmission of the atmosphere. White is opaque. Red is transparent. This 
this is wavelength at the top plane, this wave frequency at the bottom right now, that way. And you get a sense now of why the first submillimeter uh, observatories from the ground were placed with their wavelengths where they were, right? 850 microns. You hear a lot about scoop 850 microns because there's this band here where 850 microns is actually, you can see it through the atmosphere, which is otherwise absorbing everything else. Longer wavelengths like Mambo and Aztec, perhaps if you're so long. You can also see why you haven't seen that many papers on scuba at 450 microns, right? It's very difficult to do. Same thing with shark, 350 microns. It's just very difficult to do from the ground. I'm going to be talking about a Herschel Space Telescope blast a little bit as well. And their wavelengths are chosen at 250, 350, and 500 microns. Wavelengths that from the ground are basically very difficult. very difficult. They're difficult from the ground, but they are less difficult if you can get away from this problem of the air getting in your way. So this is that transmission curve again from, from a mountain fall. And this is the transmission curve from an airplane. So all of a sudden you're winning quite a lot. Then if you do it from a balloon, which is at 140,000 feet, and three times higher than it airplane cruises, that problem it mostly goes away. You're above 99% of the atmosphere. But of course, if you can, you'd like to put it in space. That problem just simply goes away. And so through that, we can see that there's been an explosion of sub millimeter data, right? From these first guys at uh, in, in the 90s to last, which was mid-2000, and now Herschel and Planck, the, uh, the area of the submillimeter surveys is a function of it, divided by the depth of those surveys is exploded. Now, I'm not going to talk about this, although this was my PhD project at the University of Toronto. I'm going to be spending most of my time here on uh, uh, Hermes. But there is a Texas connection that I wanted to point out. This thing, uh, this blast was tested before it was allowed to launch from uh, Antarctica in Palestine, Texas. So I actually spent quite a bit of time in East Texas. So, so it's kind of awesome. I really do. The, the problem is that I was a vegetarian, which is a big mistake. <laughs> but, but I'm over that now. OK, so the, uh, the Blast and Spire uh, share this, this instrument here, which is a a bolometer detector at 250, 500 microns. Really, the point to take away here is that at two, from 250 or 500 microns, the beam size, particularly for somebody who does optical astronomy, is crazy. Right? It's from a quarter to a half an arc. But the reason you want to look in the submillimeter, other than the fact that it's a tracer of star formation, is that it's a tracer of high redshift star formation. How is that, how is that the case? Well, the bands at 250 to 500 microns probe the, uh, the dust SED. Particularly, they probe the dust SED as it redshifts. So if something redshifts, it gets fainter, right? But what's happening in the submillimeter is as it's redshifting, the peak is moving into those bands, right? This peak here is moving into the band so that by the time you're at redshift 2 and beyond, even redshift 1, you're starting to probe the peak of that SED. So you're able to, first of all, see it because it's otherwise really faint, but also get a sense of the total infrared luminosity because you can probe both sides of that peak. So I can show that again here as a function, as a flux density, as a function of redshift. At lower wavelengths, 70 microns, for example, as it gets farther away, the flux goes down as you expect. But as you get to longer wavelengths, as you get farther away, higher in redshift, the flux levels off to a point even at the millimeter where it's getting higher. The flux is smaller. So this is why the submillimeter and the millimeter is actually a very good tracer. Not only of star formation because it sees the dust, you don't have to worry about obscuration, but it's sensitive to these things at high redshift in a way that other things are not. And then here I'm going to be asking the question, uh, 
can I back up the star formation history? So, uh, the star formation rate density as a function of redshift. I can do it now at high redshift because I have the ability because of this negative kink redshift. Okay, I'm going to be talking about mostly about uh, results from Hermes. The, this is the largest open time or guaranteed time survey in, in Herschel. It was in PAX and Spire. But every field was covered in Spire, whereas only a subset of the fields were covered in PAX. And it's really a huge team. It's uh, international, for sure, <coughs> with a lot of different people. So I hope that I've proven to you that the submillimeter is a great place to look for high redshift stars. And this is the reason why it's not a great place. This is the um, Hubble Ultra Deep Field, one arc unit by one arc unit. And then this is the same field at 250 microns. Uh, I blinked them so that you can do that on our video. And so here now I have the contours of that 250 micron image on top of this Hubble function field. This is a 30 millijansky source. Right? This is a 30 millijansky source. Are, are you convinced that any one of these galaxies is the one contributing to that beam? I had this thing that I wanted to show you and I forgot to put it. It was awesome. It was a low redshift uh, elliptical galaxy. Crazy in Iraq. But then, it's partial. It's completely gone. I think I'll bring it up at the end because I've got it on my desktop. The point is that identifying uh, the one galaxy, right? not trivial because it might not actually reach just one galaxy. Yeah. So this is source confusion. This is a problem. But the, the more technical way to describe source confusion is to say that you reach a limit beyond which you can no longer you, you no longer win by observing deep. So in a typical map, in a typical survey, when you observe it, you know, you observe it longer your, the RMS of your map goes down. You're, you're getting to the spur in, in time. So here I have time on the uh, x-axis and then uh, sigma on the y-axis. This is uh, the noise, basically. And red is what you get as you observe longer and longer. And green is what you get in inspired. You're actually reaching this plateau, this confusion limit. After which, if you observe deeper, you're not getting any more because of confusion. I can show that in pictures. This is the uh, shallowest, one of the shallowest fields in, in Hermes, the FLS, takes four scans. And then this is the deepest field in Hermes, 152 scans, really tremendously deeper, but you, could, you couldn't really say that, it, that you're resolving tremendously more sources. Okay, so my task is to prove to you that not all hope is lost. Sorry. Sorry. So why do you do 152 scans in the good sample? What's the question? Why do you then do 152 scans in good sample? Uh, because hindsight is 2020. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that? that no, it was no. I think there are there are advantages of using of, of using this data. I'm just not sure that the advantages are really uh, investment, to be honest. I wasn't there when the decision. No, no, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, I was just curious. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm here to prove to you that uh, that not hope, all hope is lost. There, there are things that you can do to learn information from the map itself. You can do it through cross correlations. This is the uh, the map that I uh, I stretched the colors so that you can see that the ridges of these faint emission are in green valleys between the emission are in blue. And then I take a catalog. Uh, this is the UDS, I believe. All the sources in the UDS catalog and overfall. And then you can see by eye uh, that there is a really good correlation between these, these two things. 
even if not if that only maybe one of these galaxies is necessarily resolved. Right? Okay. So I'm going to talk about how we can use this fact that there's clearly a correlation to uh, learn information within that. And I'm going to start with uh, the clustering measurements. Yeah. I was some sort of confused on why is there a plateau? So why I mean, is there a plateau? Yeah, why is there why is there a source confusion limit? Because I'm not really sure I understand maybe what confusion is or why why does it trail off? Why does it not keep going down? It go, it doesn't keep going down because uh, well you saw it in the image, right? The, the the fact that you have many sources per beam is making it so that the thing that's next door to the source, if you were to go deeper, isn't really going to emerge because the beam is dominated by that one source that's that is But what you can think of it instead is if you were to tip. I don't know. I find this useful to think of it this way, but I'm not really sure that everyone does. If you do, took a histogram of the map, you get a you get like a Gaussian shape with a bit of an excess in the high flux region because uh, that's the actual result. Of these. But otherwise, it's a, it's a it's dominated by noise or a shallow map. And then as you observe deeper and deeper, <coughs> that histogram gets smaller and smaller. The thing with confusion is that that histogram doesn't get infinitely smaller, it reaches that confusion. And that's the same idea that you have this RMS that's coming from the fact that you have a large of many sources. Is that helpful? So that's due to the resolution. It's due to the resolution, yes. Okay. It's a function of the resolution, but it's also a function of the fact that you have a very steep count in the, uh, the sub because you have many more sources at high redshift, and many sublinear than you do locally. Because star forming, they're, they're, if the tracer of star forming galaxies, the star forming galaxies are evolving like crazy at the redshift. So it's both those things. The fact that you have many faint sources. Okay. So I start with clustering. How do we measure clustering? Well, we know that we can't actually resolve any of these one sources, right? We have different kinds of galaxies, and they cluster in different ways. And typically, what you do is you know where the galaxy is, so you measure the distance between these galaxies, and then you compare it to random. And then you get a correlation function, and you can fit it with, uh, with the power law, or you can fit it with a halo model, whatever you like. But more clustered things will have a stronger uh, correlation. But so we know that we can't observe, we can't. Uh, resolve those single galaxies and make put that in the background, but those single galaxies uh, taken in, 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 as a whole, they make up big blobs on this cover, right? And the, this, the power in these different components, you can measure power to that. And we know that the two-point function and the, the two-point correlation function and the power spectrum are Fourier transforms of each other. So you're getting the same information kind of. Right? What they don't tell you is that there's a bunch of things that they don't tell you. But here, in particular, we're not measuring the correlation function of positions, we're measuring the correlation function of emission. So in some sense, it's like a marked correlation function. Anyway, the power spectrum of the infrared background looks like this, and it's made up of a few distinct components, one being the Poisson time. The fact that um, you're, just, you're measuring sources that are discrete point sources in the sky. And then we have this two halo term, this uh, linearly biased dark matter, basically. And on small scales, we have this excess, which is the one halo term. The fact that on small scales, you have these massive halos, the massive dark matter halos that are hosting more than one of these galaxies, and you're getting this excess emission on small scales. So this is the clustering measurements power spectrum of all the different uh, bands from 250 microns to 500 microns. But also on this, on these off axis here are the, uh, the cross frequency spectrum. So this is the cross power spectrum between 250 <coughs> microns and 500 microns, right? 250 and 350, 250 and 500 and so on. And why would you do this? Well, because we know that the different wavelengths from 250 to 500 microns are sensitive to different redshifts, right? So this tells us the, uh, the 
relationship uh, with two fixed microns and five hundred microns, the things that are uh, these two bands are sensitive. This is zooming in on, on that 250 micron power spectrum. Again, we notice that there's this contribution from the two halo term, the linear power uh, clustering, and the one halo term, that nonlinear excess. And what happens is um, the different colors here represent what the power spectrum is after masking out bright sources. So just to, to recall, we can't actually do the, the clustering of things that are more massive because are more luminous because we can't really properly identify them. But what we do instead is that we mask them out and look to see what the power spectrum does. Right? So masking out the most extended sources, we have this um, red here, down to masking out to 50 million genses. You see that the linear power spectrum doesn't really change, but this nonlinear the one that's coming from multiple galaxies hitting the dark matter halo is clearly, is clearly going down. So what we can say is that there's, there's clearly evidence here for the fact that the most luminous guys in the sun moon near map are also ones that are sitting in massive dark matter halo. But we can do better than that. We can try to hit, fit it with halo models. Uh, I, I don't go into the details because I'm running around with time. But the point is that depend you can you can get a very good fit to the halo model. Uh, great uh, chi squares of 1.1, and no matter what model you fit, you find that the peak uh, halo mass to host star forming galaxies is around uh, 10 to the 12. And we find that this is actually a very uh, this is a number that, that people in, are getting in simulations as well. It's but what we also find is that um, without having more constraints, that we have too many degeneracies to actually make a very good, uh, to, to, to do better with the interpretation of that halo. In particular, we have this uh, degeneracy between the redshift distribution of the intensities and the thermal SVD of the warm dust. Right, remember the, the, so each band is sensitive to a different redshift. But there's still enough uh, there's still enough uncertainty in the redshift distribution of the infrared light that you can't say that it, that it isn't accounted for by the, the peak of the SVD. We have a problem. So if you want to be able to to interpret this power spectrum measurement, this clustering measurement better, you need to do a better job of understanding what are the input parameters of the halo. Sun. It's not like we did that independent of models. But uh, the model, you have to have models to interpret from the dark matter that is. You absolutely have to have models. This is a halo model interpretation. I, I took up uh, the description of the halo model because I was going to have time. But if you want to talk about it later, I can definitely go into it. It's, it's, it's simple, but not simple. Mm -hmm. It needs to be more complicated. If you use the models to fit it, and you say the models to fit the data, that doesn't show you. That doesn't prove you have dark matter. Sure, but the model is based on, uh, on populating dark matter. It's based on NMI simulations, which are not observed. The, the correlations, the NMI simulations look like it, so we have to see dark matter. You're still fitting into models. You're, still, you're fitting into models, absolutely. So that's right. That's right. It's not using an n-body simulation in this case. So you can say it's a one halo model. You don't really know that. You know that the, the models come out. But you're not proving it's one halo, but that's the models say that if you have one halo, it looks like this, and then your data does look like this. Right. Okay. Anyway, the takeaway from the clustering is that uh, the, the more than anything, dusty star forming galaxies are tracers of the dark matter distribution. It's an important fact because I'm going to come back to that later. Yeah, the fact, wait, wait, how do you show that? The models fit it, but that doesn't show the tracing part. Well, if, it, if 
the galaxies are not tracers <coughs> for the dark matter distribution, then they would be your power spectrum would be a plus nine. It would just be completely random. You would get no clustering, you would get no uh, excess on large scales at all. So already there you're going. So the fact that the shape looks a lot like what you expect from It's the dark matter all shown as dark matter. There's a difference between Right. I guess the way that you would show that it's dark matter is that you would show that it sits in the same place that a cluster fits. Yes. Right. So I'm not doing that. You can do that in other ways, but I haven't done it. Okay, well, maybe we haven't done <laughs> And that uh, Halo model, halo model interpretations suffer from degeneracies that require more constraints. Okay. Now I'm going to address that question with with, uh, with trying to understand the, uh, the relationship between the optical background and the infrared background to see if we can make some constraints for those halo models, as well as learn some other things. Okay. So remember, uh, I showed you that uh, by eye we could see a correlation between these. Positions of these galaxies in the, in the uh, optical and near infrared and the infrared background. And what you would do, the zeroth step that you would do is that you would say, find there in any of these, um, at the position of any of these sources, I don't really see much. But if I cut out a thumbnail of each of these positions and then do a stacking of these. So averaging together all of these different thumbnails, that eventually, through the noise, will emerge the scene. And this is cool, it really works. But you should be very skeptical of this, particularly considering the beam size being so big, that you would have a, uh, a bias from, from the fact that these sources are clustered together. Before we go on to speaking about the, the bias due to clustering, I just wanted to point out that if there was no clustering, then this would not be a problem. So when the, if galaxies are randomly scattered, and then you were to do this, um, and you were to do this thing where you cut out thumbnails and then you average them together, you wouldn't get a bias. So th I proved this with a simulation where I show the uh, stacked flux over the input flux. And these colors represent different beam sizes. And the output over input for any beam size is, uh, is 1. Right? The, the RMS of that uh, simulation goes up if the, if the beam size goes up. But you get an unbiased estimate. Why am I bringing this up? When we know that galaxies are clustered, this is not really reality. I bring this up because the galaxies that are at redshift 1 and the galaxies that are at redshift 3 don't know each other. They are not important. And we can use this information to split the galaxy samples up into things that are uncorrelated and do them from one at a time. Got it? The galaxies are clustered. And just uh, and if you don't deal with that, you're going to induce a, uh, a bias in these uh, have a larger beam. So this is three positions in the cluster galaxy. And then we cut out a thumbnail around each of these guys, and we have the uh, sneaking in through the beam, this excess flux coming from your neighbors. And when you average them all together, you get this excess flux, you get a bonus. But there's a way that you can deal with that through more cross-correlation, what I call the simultaneous step. And the technique is actually very simple. I think it's very similar to something that's being done right now in a more generalized way, but less generalized way. So what you do is you take this, uh, you take a map of nothing and you, <coughs> you populate it with, with delta functions. Populate it with, you make what I call a hits map. And you compile that hits map with the PSF of your instrument. 
and then regress that with the actual sky map in order to find that one uh, number that minimizes this, this difference. So we're regressing to find this one uh, average flux of the input to this simulation. Got it? Not exactly. Okay. I don't understand when you say regress. Regressing what? Regress just means um, taking the minimum, or looking for the minimum between the map and the simulation. Okay, so that's great, but there's a, there's a complication that the, 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 the kind of uh, simulation that I showed you before doesn't have all the galaxies in the sky. If you only do it, if you only try to find this uh, stacked flux for the galaxies in your catalog, then you might actually be missing some of the things that could be biasing your result. Right? So you had that. The, those three things were involved before, but you didn't have these other guys. So in order to do this properly, in order to actually get a, a proper unbiased result, you need to have a very deep catalog, and you need to be able to account for all of these guys in your catalog. And so this is the basis of, of, of why the simultaneous stacking actually works. Because you can take, with the caveat that you need a catalog that's very complete, down to low masses, you can take them, split them up into the into sub catalogs that you're interested in, and then do this stack all together so that you're accounting for every single galaxy that might be valid by a single result. So each catalog would be a different wavelength, for example. No, these you would do them all at one wavelength, but these catalogs, for example, would represent different stellar masses. This is what we've done. Catalog one, catalog two, catalog n could all be, for example, optical. Hubble data. That's right. They could all be optical Hubble data um, selected. In. The idea, though, is that you want to be able to um, split it up into things that you think are going to be homogeneous. And that's that's the trick. So the zeroth order thing that we did was we split them up into stellar masses because we asked the question. We start with the assumption that things that have the same stellar mass will have the same subnormal flux. It may or may not be true. But you try and split it up into things that are homogeneous so that you can get an average. You will always get an average value of the things that you put into the catalog. So the question is, how can I split the catalog up in such a way that what I get out is actually So your catalog includes distance. Yeah. So it's not just flux. Your so catalog flux. should, well, if your catalog includes distance, then you definitely need because then you can split it up into redshift slices and uh, and deal with this uh, and then you won't have to deal with the fact that you <coughs> box because things at different redshifts won't box. If you don't have uh, redshift information and you want to do all the sources together, in principle it should work, but it's, then it's much harder to actually divide it up into making these sets. And this is just a, a simulation to show that this uh, simultaneous stacking actually works quite well. Again, on the x-axis, we have the stacked flux over the input flux. And on the <coughs> y-axis, we have the source density. Just shove in more sources, and your uh, bias goes up. You get a bigger beam, and your bias goes up. When you do the simultaneous stack, it doesn't really matter how many sources you have per beam. It, it always works. This is the same thing now with real data, this is um, in divisions of stellar mass, and this is the hits map after, this is the hits map after convolving with the beam, and this is the actual sky map, which, which with the reverse. Okay, so we did it in the UDS, uh, up here it says catalog. It's two thirds of a square degree, we have optical and near infrared data, and then the the catalog was, uh, had a K band magnitude cut of 2480. We fit photometric redshifts with easy and uh, masses with fast. And we separated into uh, star forming and quasi galaxies using this U minus V, V minus J uh, 
color map. And then we stacked, it on, stacked them on maps that with Spitzer from 2470 microns, Pax at 100 and 160 microns, Herschel at 250, 250, 500, and then all the way up to Aztec at 1.1. This is a result uh, from stacking at 24 microns, plus density on the y-axis, and redshift, increasing redshift on the x-axis. We get a we see that the most massive galaxies have the most flux. And as you go out in redshift, the flux is reduced. It's going down. At 350 microns, we see the same trend where the most massive are, have a higher flux. But we also see a flattening out of the, uh, of the flux with redshift. We get this negative phase correction sort of helps. And we see this, we actually see that the Flux density is increasing at 1.1 million with redshift. Again, this is that negative k correction, but it's also the fact that um, as you go up in redshift, a galaxy of the same mass will be more luminous. You have a luminosity here. And we'll get to that. Another thing that you have is when you've done the stacking at all these different wavelengths from 24 microns to 1.1 millimeters is the fact that there's correlations between these maps. If we, we can take any one bin, plot it out, and fit an average model of a dust SVD to it. And we can, then we can use that SVD uh, <coughs> model, the integral from uh, 8 to 1,000 microns, to get an estimate of the infrared luminosity of these maps. Of course, the infrared luminosity is a tracer of a star formation rate. Uh, but we don't do this study that I'm, I'm describing here isn't one about uh, star formation rate evolution. That's a big bit of time. Instead, I'm asking the question what is the relationship between the optical background and the infrared background? And how much of the infrared background can be accounted for by optical galaxies. Okay, so we do this uh, SCD fitting for every, for bins and stellar mass and in redshifts. And ask that question, how much of that infrared background that I showed you before is made up, can, can be accounted for by this near infrared, optical near infrared galaxy? We find that about 80% <coughs> of this at spire wavelengths accounted for by these uh, galaxies in the stack. And that at lower uh, redshifts, <coughs> that the lower redshift sources contribute mostly at uh, lower wavelengths. And as you step up in redshift, that uh, as you step up in redshift, you're contributing more and more to longer wavelengths. Uh, again, this thing where the longer wavelengths are more sensitive to the higher redshift. I can split it up as well in stellar mass bins, and I notice that uh, most of this infrared background is made up not from the most extreme galaxies, but actually these, these uh, mid-mass galaxies. Because they might not be as bright, but they're just much more numerous. And in fact, that's not a surprise, because when we saw the original map, we saw that most of it was fluctuations, right? It wasn't point source to resolve. And then taking those luminosities of the integrals under the uh, ESVs, we can ask the question, what is the uh, luminosity evolution for stellar mass bin as a function of redshift? Of course, the, uh, the most massive ones are dominating. And they're also evolving quite strongly with redshift. And they seem to continue to evolve past redshift, too. Whereas these other galaxies uh, seem to be turning over. Now, the, the difference between the open stars and the closed stars is that uh, it's where, the, where we have completeness greater than 90%. So this turnover is not necessarily anything more than this incompleteness. It's hard to say. And then we can divide it up by the luminosity class. So I can divide it up into most uh, luminous things here are the Eulers. 
infrared luminosity from 10 to the 11, or 10 to the 12 to 13, and then LERS is what we call normal galaxies. And so the results are these circles here, and these dashed lines are from the Betherman model in 2011. So it seemed like he had already a pretty good prediction of what we should find. And the only place that we seem to really disagree with the model is uh, in the Eulers, which gives us an indication, I mean, it's a hint, any, really, of where we might be missing things in the optical and near infrared cavity. But these Eulers, these really extreme dusty star forming galaxies, might be so dusty that they're not getting caught, that they're not getting caught in the optical cavity, which is not unusual. There are examples of very luminous, very dusty galaxies that are uh, missed in the optical. And then we can uh, see how much of the infrared, uh, uh, the, the infrared luminosity density is traced by our catalog. We see that at low redshifts, what we've seen in general, the improvement's quite, quite good. At low redshifts, the, uh, the lower mass galaxies are, are dominating this contribution. And at high redshifts, we're getting a much bigger contribution from the higher mass galaxies. It's downside, right? But this is going to be done in much more detail in the paper coming from Vinod uh, Ramudam discussing the total star formation, specific star formations. So the uh, what we see in the infrared, but also what we see in the optical, getting a good sense of the total budget. And then one last thing that we can do is we can uh, use the SEDs that we fit from the average models. And on average, we can get an idea of what the temperature evolution is for redshift for different stellar mass bins. And we see that there's a strong evolution in the temperature for all mass bins, and that it seems to be very redshift dependent and not very mass dependent, which is very interesting. And then we can and, and we can also get a sense of what the distribution of the infrared light is as a function of direction. I remember this is the two things that we needed as constraints for the Halo model. But we needed to understand the SED. We needed to break the degeneracy between the SED and the infrared background. So here we have these two components. So this, these are going to be a very strong, uh, these are going to be strong constraints for future models, Halo models. So the takeaway from stacking is that the mass selected sources make up about 80% of the infrared background, and that the mid-mass galaxies are responsible for most of the CID. But the higher mass galaxies make up most of the luminosity density at higher ratios. I didn't really get into that. And that uh, this LMZ relationship are strong constraints for future models. And I usually, if I, if I go faster, I can talk about cosmological applications, but I have a feeling I'm going to skip a little because I've gone too slowly. But for people that are interested in the CMP, the applications of the infrared background for the CMP, please come and see me after because this is another thing that I, that I quite enjoy. But I'll give you a teaser. How about that? This is a, a CMB power spectrum, similar to the power spectrum that I showed you before, with the difference that um, power spectrum is multiplied by the x axis squared, L squared. And the reason is because this is so steep that if you didn't do that, then you wouldn't really get a good sense of the power here. And so notice the bumps and wiggles that you're familiar with from the CMB at around L of 3000 turn into these power laws going straight up. These are dusty galaxies. And these dusty galaxies uh, are a real problem if you're interested in the power spectrum out here. And the reason you might be interested in the power spectrum out here is that the, that the S set, which comes from uh, Compton scattering of the electrons in very hot, very massive clusters, uh, has a power spectrum of its own. But it's but it's dominated here at these at these L these angular scales by the 
great galaxy. Alright, I'm going to go into it. Well, another thing that you can do is uh, cross correlations with the CMB. So the CMB is lens, right? Because the uh, CMB is, is, is this uniform background and then it has to come through dark matter. And the, well, this might actually be of interest because you wouldn't get a correlation between the, uh, the CMB lens map unless you had a, unless they were both tracing the, the infrared, uh, unless they were both tracing dark matter. And in fact, by eye, you can see that that's and then another thing that is interesting is I won't get into it, but uh, this, the first detection of BMOs came from actually cross correlating the BMO map with the infrared uh, background. Okay, so moving forward, we'd like to be able to get uh, to lower masses, lower stellar masses, and higher directions. But we sort of have this limit here. But knowing what we know, the, area, the answer is we can do better if we have more area. So with this in mind, I, uh, as a part of Fermi's, proposed this uh, 270 square degree field uh, helms, the large, mode, the large mode survey. And I also did, got open time to do uh, the Stripe 82 survey. Together, these all sit on the Stripe 82. And the reason for these funny shapes is that uh, the Stripe 82 is actually a pretty bad place to do uh, some millimeter observations because of galactic spheres. So I tried to fit these guys in between the galactic foreground. And of course, the Stripe 82 has a lot of data, not only STSS and box, but it also has uh, Sheila, which uh, is based on Hedtex, which is based on the road. And as well as ACT maps in the CMB, another infrared, another IRAC field uh, spies that's underway, and then a host of other things. This uh, field in particular, this uh, Stripe 82 survey, is uh, in sort of well, the point is this Stripe 82 survey is, uh, is now publicly available. The maps are available and catalogs are being constructed on and can be available as well. Some of the things that you can see are uh, resolved sources at very high redshift because they turn out good. <coughs> Galactic series, which is not really, uh, well, for some people it is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the infrared background. The maps here are made uh, with the same pick. And the reason that's relevant is that it means that uh, the, we retain the largest angular scales with this algorithm. So that you can see the transfer function. This is a bit too much detail. But it's faithful to, to 4 degrees, which is great. So the Stripe 82 has a lot of stuff in it. Some of the things that we've been trying to do are cross correlations with uh, the boss quasars. This is something that Lingyi Wang is working on and uh, is getting close to an answer. You can do cross correlations with clusters and cluster members. And some of the work that's going on right now is to do cross correlations with different parts of it. So I'll just do my summary and say it's a, it's a dusty star forming galaxy that bias tracers of the dark. Matter. The infrared background is made up mostly of typical galaxies from multiple near infrared surveys. And cross correlating large data sets is a powerful tool for answering many questions. The HERS data is publicly available at um, this website here. And the SIMSTAT code, which I described earlier, is also publicly available for download. Thanks very much. So I know that in these for 350 and 500 microns, uh, both of those fall in all the bands. And ALMA, I believe, has a better beam size than this. Oh yeah. How are they how is that how is that going to change the game? Well if you were able to survey in the same the same way that you can survey with Spire, then Spire would be awesome. 
except for the larger scales. But it's not going to be able to do this. It's, uh, it's a very small field. It's not going to be a survey instrument. So if you have specific questions, then all this is the way to go. If you have, like, just say, I, I want to know the counterpart of this optical galaxy, for example. And I want to know if it's right, a submillimeter, you should be able to see it by the second. It's really amazing. But the, uh, the, there are different strengths that Alma has. So it, as a survey instrument, that's not really easy. What's the field of view on? It depends on the interferometric configuration. Yeah, it depends on the interferometric and it also depends on which channel you're using. And the most uh, the most compact configuration is still it's, it's still on the development yes. okay. The long the, the band three, I think it is band three. Band 9, I think, is the uh, where you get the highest resolution is still something that's I'm not really sure of the status, but it's not it's not that <coughs> so what once it's up and running, it's already made. But it's a different it's it's it's, it's purpose is to do different things. Definitely uh, it's it's great if you want to go after lines. It's great if you want to resolve things because you better know exactly where they are. What about the simultaneous step? Did everyone get that? Kind of. So all the C's are the different normalization levels for you <coughs> for any given slice in mass that you have a different C. So, so the point I'm, uh, I'm trying to make is that you get an average of what you put in. So if you, if you put in stellar masses, you get the average of the stellar masses. The thing is, it's the average. The, if the galaxies that you put in are not really the same, right? that's one of my worries. Right? So if you, so there's this idea that the galaxies are can be broken up into uh, a main sequence and then starburst. And if that's the case, if they're all present in the uh, in a stellar mass bit, then I'm getting the average of those two populations that I'm getting. Now, perhaps it's possible that the starbursting ones make up a very small fraction of the total. So they're not really going to affect the average very much. It's fine. And in that case, I got the average of, I got some sort of bias with a small amount of average of um, any sequence. Right? Maybe that's not the case. So being able to split it up in a way that you want to get the average information, the average value of the thing you put in, is, 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 is a big part of the game. So, so uh, do you know what's the, what's the percentage of <coughs> sources you get uh, in Russia where there are no counterparts in optical? Is that like 1%, 10%? Do you see too many sources or not at all? There are virtual sources and there are no objects in the optical. Uh, no, no, that's a good question. How many? Well, that's that's a hard question to answer because probably what's going to happen is if you look in the optical, you're always going to see something. It's not necessarily true that they are related. Typically, what's but historically been done is that you try to follow up a submillimeter source with radio to try and identify a counter. And then you import it in the optical. So the, the first submillimeter source that made nature, the Hughes et al. one, uh, they did that. They went out there in the radio and they looked in the optical and they didn't see it. Ten years later, they didn't see it. I think they only saw, they only found the counterpart like, last year from the optical. And they did it in the So it definitely happened. But what's the percentage? I don't know. I don't even know if anyone knows the answer. Thank you.